One. Some years ago, me and a few friends of mine were living together in this old but really fancy three-story house. The owner of the house had walled off the stairways and made three apartments, one for each floor, and we lived in the middle on the ground floor. As this was an old house, soundproofing was not really a thing. But it was never a problem until both the tenants above us and below us moved out, and the new ones appeared out of the blue one night. This story is about the four to eight guys living in the four-bedroom collective in the attic. Not a joke, I never did figure out just how many were actually living in that tiny space. From the very first night they showed up, the non-existent soundproofing became very apparent. And we quickly understood that this might become an issue if not addressed. So after a few days, we rang their doorbell and introduced ourselves and really tried to greet them as friendly neighbors, making sure to be very polite and welcoming. And at the same time, we brought up the non-existent soundproofing and we asked very nicely if they could keep that in mind and that we would be very grateful. Of course, at this point, they were all smiles and agreed right away to keep the noise down on weekday nights. And in return, we would not complain about music and partying on the weekends. After all, we wanted to sleep in peace when we had work in the morning. That did not last long. I will spare you all the friendly and not-so-friendly and passive-aggressive ways we try to find a solution to our problem. Let's just say there were a myriad of attempts made to solve this peacefully. Eventually, I flat out told them that I would no longer take our noise complaints to them, the manager of the apartments, or the owner of the house, and explained that according to our laws, excessive noise after a certain time on weekdays was in fact illegal. Although common sense and decency usually made this a non-issue, and in the future I would take our complaints to the police instead, and I got laughed at for it. Now comes the revenge part. We all knew that some of the guys upstairs were dealing all kinds of fun stuff, and when I met someone I knew through work out in the parking lot, heading for the attic with a wad of cash, I got all the intel I needed. And so I waited for the weekend to pass, and you could probably have guessed it. The following Monday night, they had a big party, still going strong well into the AM, and by the smells and the smoke that wafted out of the open windows, I knew this was my moment. I called the non-emergency number for the police, registered my complaint, and gave some backstory. The nice lady on the other end was very understanding, and said a patrol car would come around in a little while. I thanked her, and said I would meet them outside. About an hour or so later, the patrol car pulled up and I went outside for a chat, and being the helpful citizen I am, I explained that the doorbell was busted, it wasn't, but a stairway in the backyard would take them up to the balcony outside of the upstairs living room, where the party was at. The officer thanked me, and I walked back inside our apartment while grinning from ear to ear. I knew what was about to happen, and it was going to be glorious. While I was posted up in a window overlooking the parking lot, this right quickly turned into the best sleepless night I've ever had. One of the officers remained by the front door while two more went around the back. Now, I don't know why there were three officers in one car, usually there are only two, but in a moment, you will understand why that was very lucky. The music got turned off a minute or two later, and just like as if there was a fire, people, backpacks, and other objects started flying out of every door and window all at the same time. I could hear a whole lot of shouting through the floor, and the officer by the front door was literally blocking the doorway, trying to stem the massive flow of people, trying to flee the scene. I made sure to take note that the backpacks and bags that were thrown out landed where there was tall grass and such, and kept listening, watching and really wishing I had a tub of popcorn. Things calmed down pretty quickly after that. But the officers didn't come back out, so I stayed by the window, and soon after another patrol car pulled up. Then another... Then one of those big ones for transporting uncooperative people. And another big one after that, you get the picture. After watching the parade of people in handcuffs disappearing into cars and being driven away, and waiting a bit to make sure everything was over, I went back outside and called over the officer I talked to earlier. Hey, I don't really know what just happened, 
and I'm sure I don't want to know, but in case you're interested, I saw some backpacks or something fly from upstairs and into that field over there. I can point out the general area if you'd like. That was a lie, of course, but being the dutiful citizen I am, I felt it was important to make sure they didn't miss anything. It could be important. A little bit of searching later, and the remaining officers left with a small pile of backpacks and bags, and I went to bed with a big smile on my face. Quiet, at last. There's a bit more to the aftermath. I had a few interviews with the police following that night by phone at the station and one where they just showed up at my door. They wanted the usual information, but since I didn't actually see them carry or sell anything, there was not much to tell. It was mainly just obvious signs, and the guy I knew from before. I didn't mention him, though. Despite that whole police raid, I technically didn't rat them out on the drugs. And I am all about technicalities, so I don't consider myself a snitch, even if some definitely will disagree with me. By obvious signs, I mean stuff like drugged out people appearing in my living room looking for a friend they couldn't name, then proceeding to go upstairs after I chased them out with various blunt instruments. Even with the sword ones. Only over time, I felt like keeping my door locked during the day. Of course, the police would not give out any information regarding their investigation and all that. But when asked, one of the officers that dropped by let slip, at least one of the bags they tossed out the window did contain something very not legal. Duh. Apparently, one or two of the guys in the attic had some brain cells, and realized I had made good on my threats and decided to retaliate by harassing me and making threats. I was still living there at the time, but I was never at home when they showed up. Weird, huh? In any case, a less than vague mention of involving the police again, and that stopped pretty quick. You'll see why. After that night, there were a lot less of a problem. But a while after I moved out, I heard from the other guys still living there that things got bad again. More of the constant partying and loud music, of course, but also stuff like trash bins emptied out in the parking lot, some vandalism and a car got broken into and busted up. None of which I can prove was the Attic Boys, of course. But I would say it's fairly likely. Our neighborhood was mostly old people and families, and kind of out of the way, so very quiet and safe in general. My friends were pretty sure the house was under surveillance for a long time after the first raid. People poking around the backyard and seeing some typical undercover cars parked close by, with people just sitting in them for hours, that kind of thing. Honestly, I thought stakeouts were a Hollywood thing. There are certain types of make and model the police use to be inconspicuous, so it's kind of easy to spot if you know them. Undercover might not be the right word here, but there really isn't a good translation for it, so it will have to do. I guess they were right, though, because there was another large upscale police raid in the attic eventually. This time nobody called the police as far as I know, they just did what police do, I guess. The guy I mentioned told me a little later that one of the attic boys was a repeat and got some time, and some of them moved out of town. That's as much as I can remember. The timeline after I moved might seem a little weird, but you will just have to forgive me. Who? The setup. I spent my teenage years living in a small town of around 3,000 to 4,000 people. My parents had purchased a house near the downtown area, just a literal block away from the bank and all the mom and pop shops. It was very convenient, except for one weekend out of the entire year. For one weekend in October, this town had a very well-known festival. Our small community ballooned from three to 4,000 people living there to easily over 30,000 people invading just that one weekend. There were booths, a carnival, a bus tour that took people out to see historical sites, a play production, the vendors everywhere selling homemade goods and food. Parking was a nightmare. No street was safe. No lawn was safe. It wasn't unusual for me to walk outside Saturday morning and find vehicles parked on our side lawn. We were very close to the main action, and some of the vendors asked very nicely if they could park there for convenience. My dad was pretty chill about it. If you asked, he always gave permission as he understood how Harriet was. We also had a two-car garage with four spaces for parking. 
two outside the garage and two between those spaces and the sidewalk. Those two were split by a median that had a spindly tree in the center. My parents would park their cars in the garage and offer the four free spaces to friends and family. And almost always we'd get elderly and or handicapped people asking if they could park there, to which my father always said yes. In fact, he started giving people our number to call and reserve a spot for free. Now for the actual deets. One year, someone decided to park in front of the median to our driveway. It wasn't a large car. I suppose they thought they could fit there without issue. However, the front and back bumper were blocking both sides of the driveway. A few of our handicapped friends arrived early and had to drive over the curb a bit to get in. My father wasn't happy about it, but getting the car towed wasn't really possible. As I said, it was a tiny town and cops had their hands full. Plus, getting a tow truck into that area would have been very difficult. Considering three of the four streets by my house, we were on a corner, were blocked by the festival. Nothing to be done about it. At some point, whoever owned the car returned to it and left while we weren't aware. The next year it happened again. Not sure if it was the same car, but again it was blocking the driveway on both sides. I walked outside that morning to greet the vendors I knew would be on our side lawn, and then go get funnel cakes, and there that car was. This time it was there, all day. My father was really unhappy. We had family and friends and folks who had reserved spots having to curb check every time they wanted in or out. We figured they wouldn't be back on Sunday as they had been last year, but also we weren't sure if it was the same person. My dad, however, decided to put a plan in action just in case. Sure enough, the next day there's that car again, blocking our driveway. I sighed and shook my head and ran off to get the morning's coffee and funnel cakes for the family. On returning, my father was putting his plan into action. The night before, he'd taken our cars out of the garage and parked them on the now empty streets. As soon as he saw that car had parked itself into the median again, he gleefully parked both cars as a fraction of an inch before their front and rear bumpers. Then he got himself a cooler of beer, cracked one open and sat on our front porch in a rocking chair to watch. It was a really nasty, cold, rainy day. So thankfully we didn't have any reservations from friends to park. My dad spent the better part of the day watching the world go by, drinking beer and waiting. Eventually, the couple who owned the car returned. They got into their car and turned it on to get the defroster working and sat there a good 15 minutes, probably assessing their situation. The driver gets out, checks the front bumper, then the back. My dad is grinning from ear to ear, but he doesn't call out to the guy. Finally, he leaves his wife or girlfriend or whatever, stays in the passenger seat. When he returns, he has a cop with him. Now, this is a small town. The cops all know my father. He's a local mechanic. Also, there's an ordinance about drinking alcohol in public. So my dad had to swiftly stash his beer and close the cooler. The cop just shook his head as he observed the situation. I'm pretty sure he was laughing internally, or maybe screaming since the festival was always hard on the local police force. He approaches my father. Hey, how's it going today? Good day to you, officer. Just enjoying the scenery on this rainy day? Look, I get that you're unhappy they parked where they did, but I'm going to need you to move your vehicles. I just want an apology from them, officer, and to promise they never do it again. The cop just sighed heavily. I'm sure they are very sorry. Please move your car for me. I'd be real appreciative. My dad takes his time doing so. The guy didn't get out of his car or roll down his window the whole time while this is going on. And as soon as the car is removed, he takes off. But not without first getting a ticket from the officer. We never had anyone attempt to park in the median again. But dad still kept our cars parked on the street just in case. 3. Just before COVID, I worked for a small telecom company that did contract work for a national cell carrier. We'll call them Crap Inc. and Big Wireless. I was hired on as a full-time employee for Crap Inc. along with every other technician, and we were not contractors. I was damn good at my job. I'd been in the field for over 20 years, so I knew my stuff and most problems were easy enough to troubleshoot and repair. 
but sometimes we needed a second tech to help out with bigger issues, which is understandable in our field. Crap Inc. was shady, unbeknownst to us, at the bottom of the ladder, but we were about to find out. About four months in, new orders came down the chain, that from henceforth we were to do double trips on every ticket. This meant we had to drive out with no parts, assess the problem, then make a return trip with parts to fix it. Two trips equals double pay for the company. Even on simple things like pushing a reset button, two trips, no excuses. Then they begin cutting our hours, tracking our every move, and redoing our timesheets after submitting it, with the excuse of employees are stealing time and we're going to prove it. The latest rule was a good one. All employees must work at least two tickets each day in order to be considered for a full eight hours of pay and 40 hours per week. No ticket, no pay. With this, they began holding mandatory bi-weekly meetings to go over every minute of our trips, overlaying GPS data, timestamps, travel distance, etc. They docked pay for gas stops, pee breaks, phone calls, everything. They even tried to not pay us for these very meetings because our trucks were off and couldn't prove we were working. Buddy, I'm not a contractor. I'm a damn full-time employee. Enter glorious malicious compliance. See, the thing is, I don't take too kindly to people stealing from my paycheck and gaslighting me about it. And apparently the other employees felt the same way. Give me one solid night of prep work and I'll beat you at your own game. The next weekend, I held a meeting of my own with the techs. And after some explanation, we all decided that the company was absolutely right. Two tickets, two trips, every minute accounted for. And the GPS data to prove it. Monday morning, meeting rolls around and every tech drove to the nearest site to have our mandatory two-hour meeting. The trucks aren't at home and running the entire time. Our daily tickets come in and we drive directly to the site, idle for two hours while we check the problem, then do our second trip to get the parts as instructed and spend two hours fixing it, drive time not included. The second daily ticket comes in and what's this? I can't seem to figure out the problem. I guess I'll have to call another tech who only had one ticket to help me. Glad he was free. Let's ponder this problem for two hours while wasting fuel. Now we need parts. Looks like we both have to go get them. Return trip complete. Another two hours to kill. Uh, fix the problem. Let's see how we did. First ticket. Two hours assessment plus one hour travel time. GPS logged. Two hour return trip and one hour travel time. GPS logged. Second ticket. Two hours assessment plus one hour travel time. GPS logged. Two hour return trip plus one hour travel time. GPS logged. To our meeting times two GPS logged. Hey boss, Crap Inc. owes every tech 64 hours of work this week. Let's check the math and GPS logs just to be sure. Oh, and for some reason the fuel expenses went up, but at least we have the GPS data we need for our extremely accurate PowerPoint presentation. Crap Inc. faulted from embezzlement, misappropriation of COVID funds, and sued by Big Wireless for two trips, no excuse amongst other things. There were a few jail sentences handed out. Not sure if anyone got a piece of that pie. 4. I'm currently moving from the country that I reside in to another country. And for that, I needed some documents notarized and apostled. I am quite in a rush because some governments are on vacation mode on some countries, since it's a World Cup. So I contacted the law agency and I have paid their fast track fee. That's basically the same thing as a fast track on air companies. You pay a shitload of more money just to cut in line. That's not something I was willing to do on normal occasions, but I needed this thing ASAP. And I know I'd be eating rice seasoned with water for the rest of the month. Two days later, I received an email from the law company. Freely adapted because I don't want to get sued. Congratulations, your documents are ready, but because the mail is on strike, we will not be able to deliver to you in time unless you pay us a ransom fee so we can deliver to you using a private delivery in time, or you will receive when the strikes are over. Now, I have paid over $100 more to have this done in time, 
and I was sincerely not happy, and by previous conversations with lawyers, I know that I can't say anything that might be taken out of context. Having two lawyers at my family did wonders, so I replied back, Good morning, law company. I have paid the fast track fee to make sure I would receive this on time. If I won't receive it in time, please reimburse the fee. We followed the contract and everything is done. We won't be able to refund your fee since this is a third party delay and it's in the rules that we do not care about that. Oh boy, did they just blame a third party when the document was with them? Good morning, law company. The documents are with you, not with a third party. If I won't receive in time, please reimburse the fee. Now you can see the frustration on their next emails. Since it was using words in bold, black, green, and orange, just missing some arrows pointing me where I was wrong. But I was getting into my Bob Dylanistic self and ready to answer. The email was too long, so I won't paste it here, but it involved rhythmized poetry, explaining that they didn't fulfill their contract. With circles and arrows and a paragraph on the back of each one, explaining where each one was. And thanks to Althro Guthrie and Bob Dylan for the email inspiration. The next email was my success, and this excerpt is exactly what I received from the law firm, just removing trackable information. Hello, Tomaz. Sensing a lot of hostility from your end, despite the fact that we're just waiting for you to make a simple decision. To avoid this email theatrics, dramatic explanations, we have decided to arrange ourselves to send a document to your address. Five. I used to work as a spare parts estimator for a fairly niche industry. My job was essentially to work out what parts of our main product the customer wanted, find out how much it would cost us to make, add a little markup and send them a quote. My boss was pretty strict on traceability, so everything needed to be recorded, including why a certain markup had been applied to a particular product. Normal value of these quotes is somewhere between £200 and a few hundred thousand. Very rarely do we get orders for anything more than that, once or twice a decade in my experience. A request for quotation landed on my desk when I was work from home during COVID, and it was a biggie. Just looking at the list of parts the customer wanted, this was going to be an absolute killer. Over a million pounds all by itself. I was told by the sales guy that if this one went well, there was another to follow for an even bigger size, ultimately looking at 10 million over the next four years. So I set to work. Normally I can do five or six of these quotes in a day, but this one quote took me six weeks to put together. I was in constant contact with 20 plus vendors getting specifications, technical details, prices and lead times for over 400 items. Finally, my masterpiece was complete. Then came the snag. The sales guy then says that because of the country this customer is in, they need to have four more quotes in from different companies in order to get it cleared by their government. Some anti-corruption policy that has been instituted. We are the OEM of the product and there's nowhere else on the planet they could get these parts from. So we'd have to work through third parties to get it done and he knew just the guy. In comes a one-man band with a dodgy-looking entry at company's house to save the day. Sales guy and him go way back, so he was going to be the preferential supplier. I asked to do the normal quotes to him, then to bump the prices up by 30%, and send that to three other companies, who had been asking about it so they would absolutely not get the contract with the end user. I argued the point, saying that the whole purpose of the anti-corruption policy is to prevent situations exactly like this, but I was overruled. The COO of the company now tells me to just do it over a phone call, at which point I request that in writing before I go ahead and do it. Fast forward two years, and there's still no order been placed. Then I found out through a different sales guy that the one-man band has been put on a blacklist by this country's government over this project. The other three companies have been turned down, and the end user is making other companies come in and take our product out and replace it with their own. A huge investigation is called for by senior management, 
my quote is ripped to pieces and examined in microscopic detail, and the question gets asked. Why did you have different prices to these other three when you knew it was all to do with anti-corruption? We should fire you. That's millions of pounds of order you've lost us. Out comes the email from my little black book. On the desk it goes. Everyone suddenly gets very quiet, and the COO starts packing his desk in a box next week. And the moral of the story is, if someone tells you to do something borderline illegal, make sure to get it in writing. For those wondering about the legality of what I did, because all of the third parties were outside of the country, where the anti-corruption policy was in place, I didn't personally break any laws. Whilst the anti-corruption policies are in place for the end user, the worst the government can do is put us on a blacklist, so all our bids in the future are either refused outright, or looked at in far more detail than others might be. I did investigate this at the time, and if there were going to be any implications on me that my company wouldn't have been responsible for, it would have been a flat no. I was acting against the intention of the policy, but not expressly breaking it. Do not do something illegal just because your boss told you to. The issue, as far as the company was concerned, was the lost millions in revenue and the damage to their reputation. The end user is a huge company with contracts and is in a reasonably close-knit industry, people talk. They ultimately wanted a scapegoat to parade in front of the board to explain why the multi-million pound deal they'd all been talking about for the last two years had suddenly vanished. I did also look at OEM Angle at the time, but because they weren't the only company who make this type of product, it didn't appear to be possible to use this as an exception. The reasoning being that the option existed to replace our system with a competitor's. I did a bit of research into the final customer, and their VP of France did some fairly well-publicized jail time a few years back for buying an oil rig from the company at a suspiciously low price. So there was no way we would have been able to convince the government that everything was above board with a direct sale. Hey everybody, Halfraiser here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 202. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do hit the like button. It makes this kind of sparkly effect now when you hit it. It's very exciting. And share the video around if you'd be so good. Thank you kindly. Right, let's see. I think we have a little birthday shout-out to do today. And today's birthday shout-out goes to Kiki. Kiki is 33 years old today. Hope you have a great birthday today, Kiki. And remember, you're allowed to celebrate for the rest of the year. Make it an extra special New Year's as well. Why not? Before we go, I'd like to sing happy birthday to you. And I'm assuming there will be cake and lots of yummy sweet things for you. And that is also a requirement, unless you don't like sweet things, in which case it's not. We're pretty flexible on the rules around here. Okay, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kiki. Happy birthday to you. Alrighty, and let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And as it's very, very cold right now, today's question is quite a sweet one. Is what is your favorite kind of hot chocolate? Or, if you don't like hot chocolate, what is your favorite hot sweet drink when the weather is cold? I'm going to say my favorite at the moment is mint, because out of the two jars I have at the moment, that's the one I've gone through the quickest. But I'd love to hear about your favorites below, and maybe I'll find something new I'd like to try. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.